I'll just share my screen just now. I've got a small presentation for you. I won't bore you too much, just on um, where we've been in terms of open data in Scotland. So, first of all, that's my name. I'm Leslie Ann Kelly, and it's Leslie Ann because, as I said, my dad's name is Leslie Kelly. So it always it gives you that little chill down your spine whenever someone says, <laughs> says Leslie. And um, that's me on Twitter, where you can find me quite often complaining about bad government data visualization. I'm the data editor at DCT Media. I work mainly with the Courier and the Press and Journal newspapers. So we our circulation is kind of anywhere above the central belt in Scotland, um, kind of above Stirling, anywhere above there, Dundee, Angus, Perthshire, the Highlands and Islands, all that kind of area. That's where we cover. Um, however, for the COVID data, I've been covering all of Scotland just because there's no point pulling out little bits of data from I may as well can present the whole picture. I have very strong opinions on pie charts, particularly bad pie charts. Um, and I can also be found on the Stushy podcast, which is in here so that my podcast producer doesn't shout at me. Um, so yes, bad pie charts. So just very briefly, in the beginning of the COVID situation, I started tracking the what was happening in around February. So the very first COVID data set that I put together and visualised was scraped from the Scottish Government Twitter account. When we first started, kind of every at 2 p.m. in February every day, the Scottish Government Twitter account would tweet out how many people had been tested. This was before we even had a positive case, but that was still interesting data to see the amount of people that were coming forward and needed tested. It was still a, a useful metric for people to look at and people were interested in, but it wasn't anywhere. The only place you could get it was if you were pulling it from the Scottish Government um, Twitter account. So that's obviously not great. And then in much of March and April, the only COVID data in Scotland was an HTML table on the Scottish Government site with snapshot data. So every day at two o'clock, they would update this data with here are today's figures. And only if you were taking pools of that data did you get any time series data. It was very fragile because there were essentially government comms officers in the back end of WordPress updating the, the data manually every day. So it was very open to human error. There were things that would throw up issues if, like, for example, if they threw in a, 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 some days they used thousand separators, some days they didn't. So if you had any kind of script set up to pull from that, it would, it would mess with them. It was, it was just very fragile data. It wasn't great. And it took a, what felt like a lot of teeth pulling to start getting that time series data in a usable format and to start getting little dribbles of more data um, out there in the public. Now, though, we do have quite a lot of data, but in my opinion, it's quite scattered around the place. And that's, it's not great for the people that actually need the data. So that's one of the things I'm quite passionate about is taking all of this data and putting it together in a way that people can actually use and, like you say, make decisions from and in their day to day lives. For example, data on cases, it, the Scottish Government site now publish two spreadsheets every day at two o'clock, one just with Scottish data, one with data broken down by health board. There is a Public Health Scotland dashboard. There is some open data on statistics.gov.scot and there's also an NHS Scotland open data site. One of the issues with this is, there, I can't think of any logical reason for it, but the Scottish Government site publish health board area data, which some of the health boards in Scotland are absolutely massive. The Highlands, for example, is the biggest health board I think in the country in the terms of the actual footprint it covers so it's not particularly useful data for someone living in a small area of the highlands but it's the Scottish government data is the most high profile the statistics.gov.scot and the NHS Scotland open data site are very not many people seem to know about them so whenever I that's the only place you can get lower level geography data so for example local authority data and whenever I publish that I, I generally tend to get people thinking I'm some kind of a wizard and wondering where I've got it from because it's not out there in a very publicly accessible way and both the statistics.gov.scot and the NHS Scotland open data site are not very user-friendly at a glance so yeah we, there's lots of data that's scattered. Death data is even more scattered so that it's published in the same places as the case data however once a month the NRS put out a big report on 
all of their findings. It's a bit like the ONS report, which is still weekly. The NRS report used to be weekly, but they started dipping down to a much lower level and they moved to monthly. I imagine that might change at some point soon. And then in the weeks that the NRS doesn't publish that data, it's on what's called the Four Harms dashboard, which it, it just kind of moved there one day. It wasn't very well publicised. And I find that half of my job is becoming a bit of an investigator to find all of this data and piece it together for people. And I think without kind of, not to blow my own horn, but without people like us that are putting together these dashboards or these collections of data, it would be very difficult for your average person out there to, to look at the data and make informed choices on, on how they live their lives. And I think that we've essentially filled a gap that the government should be filling, that all of the one of the issues I have with the dashboards that have been published so far is that there doesn't seem to be very much of a, a mobile first type of design and a lot of these dashboards are they're like tableau dashboards or things like that and they don't work very well on mobiles which is something that as a data journalist working for a newspaper I design everything mobile first because that is 70% of how people come to our site so it's it's a very important way that you need to get the point across so I'm going to move to, I'll stop sharing just a second so I can reshare with the right. I'll show you what I've done with the data briefly. So if I go to Google, I just thought I'll pull up the actual site. Um, just so, rather, so you can actually see what it is. So if I go to the courier, This is where you can find all of the data I've pulled together. It's on the Courier, it's on the Press and Journal. I think it's on the Evening Titles as well, but I'm based in Dundee, so the Courier is kind of my home brand. Um, so if you click on this Coronavirus tab, and then it's always pinned here in the Coronavirus tab. A few times we have accidentally removed it and I immediately get emails of complaint from people. So I will slowly scroll down to give it a little bit of time to load because there's an awful lot of data here. But this date here is there mainly as a, a sign of that is the last time probably I didn't have, I could leave the house at 2 p.m. because now every day I'm kind of tied to my desk because a lot of this open data is, is great and you can run scripts and um, automate a lot of stuff, but there are issues at least once a week. So you have to kind of check that things are working and I don't want that publicly out on the site if it's inaccurate data. So every day I'm having to check things are are fine. So this is probably the most automated that I've got. Um, this is I put this right at the top because as I said, I find that people are really interested in data on their local authority area rather than their health board area. So this is a very quick snapshot of new cases in the last 24 hours and the uh, case rate over the last seven days. Um, and I find that people really like this format because it's just it's very quick and dirty and um, people can go and see their local authority and see how it's, it's done in the last day um, in terms of other things we have which are all pulled from either the scottish government site or the um nhs open data site and um, i tend not to use the statistics.gov.scot site just because i find it very frustrating <laughs> um but yeah daily testing data so we have the nhs lab so that's pillar one and then the uk gov labs pillar two um, this was a very recent addition. This was added on Monday or Tuesday. And I have been begging for this data for months now. So it was a very welcome addition. It was added onto the NHS Open Data site, which is the same as the above, just testing Pillar 1 and Pillar 2, but by area. Unfortunately, I've asked and there's no plans to publish this by local authority. Um, but it's it's better than, than the nothing we had before. Because one of the questions I would get quite often when there were, for example, the Grampian outbreak or we had the Cooperangas outbreak is, is it just that we're testing more? And I didn't know because there was no local testing data available. So that's great. Our daily case chart. I will say everything on this page has changed since it was published on March. I don't think there's a single chart that has remained, that they've all been upgraded or changed. And that is one of the, the the troubles is kind of moving with the times of what is the kind of key metric this week. I find that it's, it's changed a lot. We've gone from just being interested in cases and then it was excess deaths and percentage positivity is now a big factor. Our number, you know, it's, it's kind of, you have to move with whatever people are really interested in or whatever the government is saying is the key metric at the time. 
So this is the case positivity. I've highlighted that line where the WHO says that we should essentially not be out of lockdown if we're above it. And as you can see, we're doing fantastic. Um, this was something I added fairly recently as well when there was the more publicized university outbreaks um, talking about the kind of clusters in the 15 to 19 age group. You can see in um, the first wave, they were very, very unaffected by the virus and a lot of that was probably due to we weren't testing them because they weren't presenting in hospital and in the first wave we weren't we were really only testing people that were very sick but it, it shows that cluster becoming an issue when universities reopened and what it also shows for me is that cluster kind of dripping downwards it's the kind of what I call the taking it home to granny effect so it's you, you can kind of see that effect in this heat map and I also I, I've been I don't know if you follow Colin Angus on Twitter. He does some lovely stream graphs of the age ranges. So I popped that in as well. I, I imagine it's probably something that a lot of people find difficult to read, which is why I think the heat map is there as well, just to balance it out. One of my things is, like I said, I'm very passionate about making these things in a way that people can easily understand. And sometimes I do things purely for my pleasure of creativity, but I always try to match that up with something that's a bit easier. Um, this is just kind of... Our, case like line chart um this is quite a recent addition as well so it's by local authority as i said people find that more informative and you can flick between the cases that are new today per 100,000 or your total cases um how has it spread in each health board so again it's pretty much on the rise everywhere in scotland right now and the western isles is it's pretty concerning this is just, again, I always try and put a few different ways of visualising the same data because people understand things in different ways. This is just the same data visualising a different way with the daily new cases um, and unfortunately the deaths. This is one of the things that was very difficult early on was when you guys all have had the same thing down south with the difference between the DHSC data and the ONS data of the different death definitions and people being very confused over that and that was a, an issue that we had early on. So the the kind of dark blue line is the confirmed death. So that's the people who've died within 28 days of a positive test. Um, and the kind of teal line is the NRS data. So that's where the death has been noted as a contributory factor on the death certificate. And people get very confused over this. So that's why I think it's important to have it in the same chart and have the kind of definitions in there so that people can try and get their head around it. They're, they're different measures. Um, and they're both helpful in their own way. Um, deaths by fatality, um, deaths by health board, and we've also got it by local authority. This doesn't get updated as much nowadays because we don't get that data as often. The NRS publish this data and it's only once a month now. This is an interesting one. This is the lowest level of geography that we've had available in Scotland. I understand that you guys have had MSOA data for a bit longer than we have, and this is kind of the equivalent of that. Um, it's called the intermediate zones in Scotland. The only data that's been published on this is deaths by intermediate zone published by the NRS and it only gets published again once a month, if that. Um, there is recently been published on the Public Health Scotland Tableau dashboard, they've published cases by intermediate zone, which is great, but from what I hear online, nobody uses that dashboard because it's very cumbersome. And as I said, <laughs> doesn't work well, doesn't play well with mobile and people just, they find it difficult to navigate. So I have spoken to Public Health Scotland and they are, they've told me getting their hands on some of the data to publish on the open data site. So as soon as I have more data at that level, it will be on here as well. Um, some data on age ranges. The further you go down the site, it, it's probably the less updated data. It's probably more the monthly updated data. I try and kind of have the daily updated figures closer to the top because that's what people are interested in. So this is um, deaths by population density of the health boards in Scotland. Um, and this is, this is an important one that I should probably push further up the site just now because it's become more recently important is hospitalizations and intensive care. And you can see one of the issues with this was on the 11th of September, the Scottish government changed the definition. I don't know, there was a bit of a, a stushy with um, Carl Hennigan published from the Centre of Evidence-Based Medicine criticising the Scottish and Welsh governments and said that they were overcounting the way that they 
categorised um, COVID hospitalisations and there was a bit of substance to it. So the government went away and recategorised. Essentially back here, it was anybody who was in hospital who'd had a positive COVID test and they may no longer be treated for COVID. They were still categorised as a, a COVID hospitalisation. And later on, that, that became a bit problematic because the definition, apparently, I didn't realise this until the change, I don't think they said this until they changed it, but one of the issues was that someone could go into hospital with COVID, come out a week later, be out of hospital for a week, get hit by a bus. <laughs> it's always the example of being hit by a bus. I mean, how many people are hit by a bus? But that's what we always say when we're talking about these things. Get hit by a bus, be back in hospital, and they would be re-added to the COVID hospitalisations count because they'd had a COVID test in the last 28 days. So that, that wasn't great. The number from here with this line is the new methodology where it's just people being treated for COVID in hospital. There is still a 28 days factor on that. And we know from experience that there are people who have been in hospital for a lot longer. So even this new methodology is problematic, but it's been rising sharply again in the last few days. It's been, yeah, it's not great. And these are weekly death figures of um, where the deaths have happened and you can just about see that there's been an uptick, uptick in the deaths in the last last few weeks. I have one chart on cases by cases and deaths by deprivation because um, there's not a whole lot of data on that. Um, I know bar chart races are a bit, there's a, a lot of people don't like them particularly for COVID data but I this seemed to do well um, People seem to like this on social media for showing when the COVID had fallen back down the ranks of the leading causes of death in Scotland. So it's quite a good visualisation for that. The R number, which again has not been doing great. And then this is the only bit where I dive into any ONS data. So I weekly I do pull the ONS and NISRA data on the excess deaths just to just to put this chart together to to show how we're doing with the rest of the country and i do daily pull from the data.coronavirus.gov um just to put the cases into context with yes we're, we're doing badly but the peaks are at the same time everywhere it's, it's a uk wide widespread and this is the last chart I've got which is weekly confirmed and suspected deaths per million population it was just something someone had requested and I must have been feeling charitable that day so <laughs> I added it onto the site so yeah feel free to go away and have a look at the site and give me any feedback you have if there's anything you think I'm missing a trick on or anything that you find helpful or unhelpful um, I think the site's actually loaded quite well today it can be pretty slow because there's a lot of stuff on here technically this is all done within Flourish which I don't know if you've heard of it's a, a data visualization tool they are very good in newsrooms the, one of the co-founders was a Guardian journalist I believe um, and so they have a passion for journalism and as part of the Google News initiative they have funded they give it's not a a pro account per se, but they give extra enhanced accounts to newsrooms for free, which is absolutely great. So everything that's on the site is we've we've been able to do for free, which is is great. Most of it, or as much of it as possible, pulls from the open data. I find I have to kind of run a lot of things via a Google Sheet, which is frustrating to do some extra calculations or to kind of do things like in the when this data was first published, they didn't publish the actual area names. It was the area codes. So I then had to kind of run that through an intermediary to, to match up the codes with the names, because if I just publish that with codes, people don't have a clue what that means. But yeah, as much as possible is automated. But as I said, not a day has gone by since the 18th of March that I haven't had to look at the COVID data and check that everything is running appropriately and as it should. It's it's become my life now. I have said to the people at Public Health Scotland that I hope they are putting some funds away to fund all of the post-traumatic stress that all of the people who've been visualising COVID since March, when, it, when this is all hopefully over, when it comes to two o'clock and we start getting the, the palpitations of, oh God, I've got to go check the stats. So hopefully one day I won't be, won't be checking all the COVID yeah. stats at 2pm every day. But for now, that's my life.